I just thought uh, I'll put a few sermonettes, you know, just as we are cooked up with this coronavirus, which is one of the things that we're supposed to be seeing in the end time. Something just to encourage the believers, you know, those who are Christians and they like to, they're looking forward to another world and those who are not conforming to this world that we are in, but are looking forward to another land, just like our father Abraham. Today, I'm just going to talk about the way we react when uh, God imposes uh, on us uh, problems or hardships, as I would like to call them, like our brother Job. Right, for starters, the title of the message is going to be Even Now, Lord. And these are only sermonettes, you know, just not too long, just under 15 minutes. So you can spare a little 15 minutes in a day just to listen to what the word says. It's not about me, it's about the word. So when you read, uh, uh, you know, St. John's 11, you look that in, in verse 21, then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou would have been here, my brother had not died, but I know that even now, even now, you didn't come when we called you. You didn't come when we sent again three times, but I know that even now, because that's where most of us believers fail. It, we fail on that even now, Lord. You ask the Lord for five years to heal you, like Mr. Unbeliever, you run away and say, no, it's not, it's, it's not true. When God is trying your faith, it's about the time to, for you to give in to that faith and say, even now, Lord, even after 29 years of uh, having cancer, even after 100 years of being poor, but even now, Lord, you are more than able to deliver me from all this affliction because God is God of all things, the creation. He can do all things. He can create. He can create squirrels like he did in our time. He created a ram for Abraham so he can do all things. He can heal you. He can save you. He can uh, prosper you. All things that, because all things are possible to them that believe. Let's look at a few examples. If you look at James as well, 4 7, it says, Resist the devil and he will flee. And then 2 Corinthians 4 10 4, the weapons of our air warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty to the pulling down of the strong walls. So what do you do when you're sitting in your airship in your travel? It brings Jesus on the scene. And when Jesus is on the scene, Brother Branham tells us, it brings in new hope. So while you're sitting on your airship, Jesus comes in, brings in new hope. Mary and Martha, they were sitting on an airship. Lazarus has died. Jesus comes in. I am the resurrection and life. And Lazarus was resurrected. So I want to go through a few things that happen when God imposes an airship on you. Remember, Job was on the airship because God had been uh, boasting about Job and saying, look at my servant Job, there's none like him on earth. That's why he was boasting and that's why the devil was allowed to try him. So he will do the same with you as you are a believer. But if you are not a believer, then you can't go through that because every son of God, every daughter of God that comes to him has to be tried and tested in the fire, in the, in the water, under water, but all through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. First thing that the, the ashes brings is one, it brings uh, glory to God. God is not willing to share his glory with anybody. Brother Branham in the message I know, he says, when you become the property of God. So that means when you become the property of God, anything that he's going to ask you to do, you're going to do. Think of your property. If you say you own a car, you can go into your car and drive it anywhere where you want, even to commit sin. Your car will not complain. So that's the kind of Christian that God is looking in the end time. A Christian who will obey because obedience is better than sacrifice. Obey the word of God regardless of circumstances. So number one, it brings glory to God. Number two, it improves the relationship with God. Number three, it gives you a testimony as well. And then number four, it forces you to use your weapon because the weapons of your warfare are not carnal. And no weapon that is fashioned against you shall prosper. And then number five, it brings in the whole word together because you've got the written word, spoken word, and manifested word. Written and spoken 
They are good, but they are not complete. They need to be manifested so to become uh, complete. An example, when God said, let there be light. If light did not come, if this sun that we see today did not come, then that written or spoken word had not manifested. So the word has to be manifested. He says, I'm the Lord that healeth all thy diseases. So when you are sick, he still hasn't manifested it to you. So what do you do? You keep asking. Matthew 7, 7. Ask, you shall receive. Seek, you shall find. Knock, you shall be open. And Brother Branham tells us, you must keep on knocking. Don't stop knocking. Because when you stop knocking, you are going, not going to receive because God is trying your faith to see whether you really believe. I remember the story we were given by Brother Branham. There was a man who said, oh, I can push my wheelbarrow across this uh, tiny little place, uh, a bridge that, that was there, not very uh, good at all. But when it came to the point that the man who he was talking to, and he said, I can even push you across the bridge, that became different. So God, by giving you these assets, these troubles, is testing your faith. Are you able to stand like your father Abraham? like Brother Branham in all those testing, losing his wife, losing his child. Are you able to stay? I know my Redeemer liveth, And on that day, he shall stand and I will see him like Job. So it is important that the word becomes manifested. And remember, victory always leads to victory and uh, failure also leads to failure. So the atmosphere that you live with you must always create a conducive, positive atmosphere of God for God to operate because it is about the atmosphere. If you take a hen's egg, like what we are told by Brother Boswell, and put it under a puppy, it will hatch because the warmth that is required is under the same puppy. It don't have to be a chicken. So let's quickly look at uh, Job. What did Job saw after he see after his resurrection? His uh, airship, he saw the resurrection. Because all his life, he could see perpetual life, death, burial, and resurrection of the trees. But man, he was just shoved in the grave, and that was it. So when he saw the resurrection, Job was ready to die. Abraham saw Melchizedek. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they saw Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever, that fourth man. And Daniel saw the pillar of fire that we have a picture of today. And the apostles, because they were despondent after Jesus died, they assumed when he came in, he was just going to destroy the Roman Empire and take over straight. But when they, he was killed, then they said, what, hey, what's going to happen now? Because we've got nothing. But when they saw him after the resurrection, they realized there's a death, burial, and a resurrection. That word that had been promised was manifested before them. David saw Goliath laying on the ground. Joshua saw Jericho's walls crumbling down and he walked over them. Moses saw the backside of God and he also saw the pillar of fire. So Jesus, when he went through his ashes, everything was put under his feet. Before he went through Calvary, death, burial, and resurrection, he did not have power. But after your trial, that's when you get power, brother. So when you finish your trial, it is where the two omnipotencies meet. And it is the rising of the SU, both the SUN and the SON. Just as God, as the sun rises, so does the SON. Just as the SUN rises, the SON rises as well. That is God, you, equal results. Two omnipotence meet. The miraculous has to happen. And remember, it is biblical to go into, suffer, to, into uh, temptation and suffering. Because Brother Branham in the message, uh, Shalom, preached in 1964 in Sierra Vista. He says, suffering for his name's sake is growing pains of his grace. Because we've been taught that there must be two or three witnesses. Many churches in the message today, what they're doing is they, are, uh, they get tongues and there's only one set of tongues. There's no, nothing to, 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 to compare it to. That is wrong because there's got to be two or three witnesses to anything that happens in the church because that's the Bible. And I can give you a good example. 
when Jesus Christ was resurrected, when Mary and the, and the sisters went to the grave, they met an angel and he told them, go into Jericho and tell my disciples and Peter. And Peter, that's another sermon when God, God knows you by name. And then before they got to the disciples, Jesus himself met them to give the second witness that go unto Jericho and tell my brethren and Peter that I'll see them over there. So the second witness after Brother Branham says suffering for his namesake is growing pains of his grace. We find that James comes in and says, brethren, count it a joy when you go into, when you fall into diverse temptation. And Peter comes in, the third one says, they are more precious than silver and gold. Brother, sister, that is what we believe. That is the message of the hour. That is for the bride of this time. The bride is, if made yourself ready, there's nothing else that you're gonna need. Everything we need, like Brother Branham says, is like a little uh, apple tree. When you plant it down, all the apples that are in that tree are in that small little tree. All it needs is to keep drinking and drink, drink more than its share. Many of us are not praying enough. Many of us are not listening to the message enough. Many of us are depending on our pastors. No, pastors are good. But remember, you can't go and stand before God with the word of your pastor. I have tell you a story about me. I am not a pastor. I am just somebody who just enjoys sharing the word, an evangelist if you like. But the way I do it is, if a pastor comes to me and says, do this, 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 the first thing I ask myself is, is that in the Bible? If the pastor says it's in the Bible, or Brother Brown said it, I am under obligation to do it. But if it is the opinion of the pastor, I'm not under obligation. I have a choice to take it or to leave it. Because I want to stand on that day with the word of God and the word of the prophet. Because that's the goal, the Lord of our harvest that never does anything until he reveals it to his prophets. We have seen many pastors backsliding, some of them calling themselves eighth messengers and so forth, a replacement to Brother Branham. There's nothing like that in the message, brother. So remember, your pastor is a good man, but never ever put your pastor before the Lord or the prophet. And uh, God bless you. Hopefully to meet you again in the next video. Shalom.